The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we'll glide into the combat zone with pilots from World War II whose silver wings were emblazoned with the letter G. See why combat photographer John Gapps III believes his images barely scratch the surface of war, poverty, pain, and happiness. And see the deep relationship between the Call Ballroom, the Quad Cities Mexican American Association, and the Davenport Hispanic community. The image of gliders as free-flying aircraft without engines belies their role as valuable military assets during World War II. So our resident aviator and Side Roads host Paul Burge wanted to tell the stories of the unsung Iowa heroes who flew behind enemy lines to deliver troops, munitions, and supplies on silent wings. I've always had a love of aviation, something I inherited from my father who served in the Air Force during World War II. Aviation has made some of its greatest advancements during wartime. Ironically, as the U.S. entered the war in 1941, the Air Force took a step backwards when it decided to resort to powerless gliders to transport troops and supplies into combat. The pilots endured tough flight and combat training to earn silver wings emblazoned with the letter G for glider. Tim Bailey of New London, Iowa, who fought in Burma, is one of the many Iowans who volunteered to be a glider pilot. I wanted to fly, and uh, I just felt that uh, the glider program was new, and uh, I was just infatuated by getting into the glider program, and uh, I, I felt that I wanted to help win the war also, and so I, I dove in. Ordinarily, a student pilot took that initial dive in something like this, a low-powered two-seat trainer that could get airborne on its own power. But as Robert Wingem, a veteran glider pilot from Carroll, Iowa, explains, to get a glider airborne takes a tow rope and a twin-engine transport. They'd line the C-47 up, and then behind them, there would be two gliders. One, went, one would have a shorter tow rope than the other, so they would not have less problem getting tangled, because when you're pulled, and with a lot of turbulence, because there's a lot of airplanes, you have a tendency to want to get pulled together. Flying that glider behind, in double tow behind a C-47, you, it took uh, about 15 minutes is about all you could fly that sucker. You know, no, no automatic pilot or anything on <laughs> it on a glider. The automatic pilot was the guy. <laughs> Gliders were big and slow, making them ideal targets for enemy gunners. Without armor protection, casualties were usually high, but despite the potential danger, volunteers were readily available. This new glider branch lacked two key elements, gliders and glider instructors. Making gliders was relatively easy. Everyone from coffin manufacturers to Ford Motor Company was cranking them out. In the rush to train pilots, Spencer, Iowa was transformed into a military glider training base using civilian flight instructors such as D.C. Powell of Des Moines, who'd never flown a glider. Well, I'm not, I'm not really a glider pilot. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I didn't go through the, through the school. So you were only teaching I them. was the instructor, but I, wouldn't go, I didn't go through the school. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you couldn't qualify technically to be a glider pilot. <laughs> only an instructor. <laughs> only an instructor. 
In the summer of 42, DC taught the future glider pilots by cutting the engine on a powered aircraft and gliding back to Earth, a risky maneuver at times. Anyway, the student uh, popped the stick forward and dove the glider into the ground, and it killed both of them. And he was the first casualty of the glider program. Those who survived primary glider training graduated to fly the WACO CG-4A, the workhorse of the U.S. glider program. I liked it a lot. It, it's it's uh, a big airplane, uh, no motor, of course. Uh, I think that uh, I think you had to have probably more uh, flying skill to to fly that airplane than you did one with the motor that you could just put the throttle to it or take it off and so forth. Uh, it had a lot, you had to keep ahead of your plane all the time and planning and so forth what you're, what you're doing. But it had, it had a great feel and a, it, was, it was a great airplane. We, we of course uh, called them the flying coffins. The gliders were the predecessors of today's helicopters and could silently transport troops, artillery or jeeps into combat. And in Burma, Tim Bailey proved that gliders could not only take supplies into a war zone, but take refugees out when he was called upon to rescue a Burmese family about to fall into enemy hands. They came and said, uh, we want you to go on a mission, go down in the jungle and rescue a family from harm's way. And uh, I, was, I was towed to, the, to that place in the jungle they wiggled their wings, I cut off, we went down, and the family came running out to look at the glider and say, go get your things and, you know, get in the glider. After landing, in order to get the glider out of the jungle, two poles were set up with a snag line between them. Then a tow plane descended and snatched the glider out. In less than five seconds, you're off the ground. But the tow plane was laboring to get up over the mountain that came to a V and uh, the trees kept getting closer and closer and rising, but we did make it over, and I can see yet the leaves on the top of the trees as the rope just missed it by a few feet. By war's end, 13,909 CG-4A gliders had been built. Over 6,000 pilots were trained. 138 died in crashes, and 208 were killed in action, including six from Iowa. The survivors returned home and put their war stories in the attic with their uniforms and medals. Today, 11 World War II glider pilots remain in Iowa. After serving as a glider instructor, DC Powell flew C-47s across the hump in the China-Burma-India theater where he spent many hours aloft writing poetry. In one poem called Silent Wings, DC captures the spirit of the glider pilot when he wrote, in my glider, I pretend the wings are attached to me. With my silent wings, I too, like a bird, can be free. But for all the beauty of flight, it was still war fought by young airmen who did what was expected on silent wings. It's one thing to choose a profession and see where it leads, and quite another to choose a profession that you know will lead you into the world's most violent and poverty-stricken areas. When John Gapps III chose combat photography, he chose the latter. But what he couldn't foresee was the way it would affect his life. Please be advised that some of the photographs in the following feature contain graphic scenes that may be inappropriate for young or sensitive viewers. It's said that a picture is worth a thousand words. But when you look at a picture, which words make their way into your mind?
For Associated Press photographer John Gapps, photography isn't about documenting a scene. It's about capturing a moment in the struggle of life. For the last 12 years, this Des Moines-based photographer has captured the spirit of life's battles. From family farms in Iowa, to ice rinks in Norway, food lines in Somalia, to battlegrounds in the Middle East. Many photographers will go overseas and they'll come back with a lot of pictures of brown-skinned people looking soulfully up into the camera. Anybody can take that picture. But the struggle to capture the passion of another person's existence, that's being a photographer. Just like eating a wonderful meal and drinking too much, you get a bill at the end and you go, oh my god, how could it have cost this much? This is the bill at the end of the feast. OK, you're going to kill a lot of people, and you're going to take over another country, and you're going to blow things up. Here's the bill. These are the lives that you've touched. We caught up with John on a day where senators outnumbered snipers, using his assignment at the Iowa State House as an opportunity to delve into the details of his life. Between pictures, we learned of his love for poetry his goal to live for today and not worry about tomorrow, and his turning point on the path to becoming a professional photographer. I went up to Iowa State University, and I had a professor in it by the name of uh, Willard Gillette. And he saw that one of the strengths I had wasn't so much that I was a very artistic photographer, but I was willing to do run against a brick wall 100 times until it fell over. And he said, make sure what you point your camera at is important. And I decided right then and there that I wanted to be a combat photographer. You cannot get in the middle of an insurrection or a war and choose sides. The one thing I have is trust that what I'm showing you is truth. And if people say, yeah, but this is the guy yesterday that was helping the Israeli soldiers get away from the, well, then you don't trust me. You can't trust in my pictures. And then they lose all their truth. For John, truth is watching an Iraqi prisoner of war beg for his life, knowing there's nothing you can do to stop his execution. Truth is finding a Haitian woman who's been trampled to death in a food riot and left behind on the bloodied concrete. And truth is catching a glimmer in the eyes of a child, only to realize he's died in the time it took to blink. The most emotional experience I ever had on a battlefield was a, a Serbian soldier, and most of his head was blown off. That didn't really bother me a lot. What bothered me was I looked down and on his wrist was a watch, and it was still running. And for so many different emotional reasons, my entire world came to a halt, and I became untethered in time to think that this guy laced his boots up this morning and wound up his watch, or put, even put it, if I thought I was dying, I don't think I'd be putting a watch on. That's the stuff that really, really stays with me. The people. You deal with a, a lot of anxiety when you're sitting at the symphony in the middle row and all of a sudden you feel like hyperventilating because one of these bad little scenes blooms into your consciousness and your heart feels like it's going to tear out of your chest. But you know, poor me, I'm living in middle America in the lap of luxury compared to the rest of the world. It doesn't matter if I, if I feel bad or not. It's unimportant what I feel. It's important what I do. John admits that even the best photograph cannot completely capture the meaning of a moment. For him, writing poetry helps pick up where the pictures leave off. Slow your step to mine. Give to the leisure pace earned against this deliberate chaos. God left us alone here to witness the strange things, the cruel things done in his name. As he recovered from being shot in the leg while on assignment in the occupied Gaza Strip, John compiled God Left Us Alone Here, a book that pairs his pictures with his poetry. But whether it's through his images or his words, John hopes others walk away with a better understanding of the struggles we all share an understanding that perhaps Middle Eastern women in veils aren't much different from Midwestern farmers in overalls. During the Gulf War, 
the Iraqis were, oh, they're, they're, they're nothing, they're animals. We're going to kill them. After those U.S. soldiers I was with met those Iraqi soldiers and saw, wait, these are just people like us, oh, Lord, and they're hungry. They started getting their food out. Instead of shooting them, they're feeding them, for God's sake. It's an instinct that we connect. Even as John puts the finishing touches on pictures of Iowa legislators, stories of life and death continue to creep into his downtown office. As a listener, it's hard to know how to respond. It's as if you want to say you're sorry, to whom and for what you're not quite sure. But even John, a veteran combat photographer who swears he has no fear of death, finds it hard to know what to do with his memories. I'm sure my subconscious is much like this office. It's just, oh yeah, that, I gotta get at that someday. And, you know, sooner or later something falls off the shelf on me. You know. God left us here alone. If we choose to slaughter each other or we choose to heal each other, it's our choice and we have to figure it out ourselves. The Coliseum Ballroom in Davenport was destroyed by fire in 1913. Rebuilt the following year, the call had escaped flames until just last spring when another fire broke out. Damage from this one, though, was limited to one piece of paper, the mortgage on the building. The proud new owners are the members of the Quad Cities Mexican American Organization, who are turning the landmark building into a multicultural meeting place. For generations, Quad Cities young people have lined up for a chance to catch their favorite bands at the Coliseum Ballroom. Louis Armstrong played the call back in the 40s, Tommy Dorsey, and Frank Sinatra, too. Roy Orbison, the Everly Brothers, and Reba McIntyre performed here. Jimi Hendrix left his autograph on the wall. Michael Cervantes grew up just a few miles from the call on the Illinois side of the river. But back then, a night of dancing was out of the question for Cervantes and many of his friends. I knew it was a great place where a lot of people went to dance. And I lived in Moline. I did not live in Davenport. So that meant that we had to take a bus over here. Uh, so that cost money. And then the admission, that was something else. Tony Navarro remembers the call ballroom as being out of reach for him also back when he was a soldier during World War II. My wife and I came to this store here, and we weren't allowed in here. My wife and my best man and his wife. And uh, they said I could get in, but they couldn't get in because they were dark skin, darker color. Well, uh, let me check in the book, and I'll be able to tell you for sure. These days, the dancing shoe is on the other foot. Navarro and Cervantes are charter well, members really of the Quad Cities Mexican-American Organization, the group that keeps the ballroom in step. We put on a new roof, $77,000. Our new combination heat and air, just a little bit under $100,000. In the spring of 2002, after eight years of contract and mortgage payments, Cervantes, Navarro, and the rest of the members became the proud owners of an American classic. The keys to their success, they say, were a handful of local investors, lots of hard work, and a friendly banker who believed in them. I wish I could bottle the looks and the feelings that Tony and Mike had when they, they knew they were going to have the place paid off. And uh, it was a very proud time for them and for me, really. The purchase of the ballroom means that it will continue hosting important Quad Cities events. Dating back to that first livestock show in 1914, the call is said to be the oldest continuously operating ballroom in the country. You're going to have the type of an event where families want to sit together. For the Mexican-American community, though, like the implications of the sale go far beyond the preservation of a classic American institution. Their operation of a community meeting place signifies a solid step in an American ethnic group's acceptance into the community. Their pride in their accomplishment is matched only by their humility. You know, I like to think that for whatever reason, someone allowed us to do this. I would, you know, I don't dare to think that we were so smart, you know, that we did this all by ourselves. All right, 25. 
The Mexican-American organization makes the ballroom available for all sorts of events, from weddings to bingo, while catering to the various ethnic groups in and around the Quad Cities. The Vietnamese celebrate their New Year here. The Irish, St. Patrick's Day. The Bosnian community gathers here too, as do veterans and, of course, ballroom dancers. The good part about that is that we understand their situation. And the better part of that is that they appreciate that we make them comfortable when they come here. In late summer, the call's air-conditioned comfort brings in music fans for a most American celebration, the three-day Big Spiderbeck Memorial Jazz Festival. But it's the impact that the all-volunteer Mexican-American organization has on its own that brings the members the most satisfaction. Operating as a nonprofit organization, the group invests a major share of the ballroom's revenues in community education. The grant program they started has helped scores of college students pay for their books. And every year, to help ensure that there are plenty of students hitting those books, high school senior women are honored at the formal debutante ball. This was our 21st year that we have an annual debutante ball. And the primary speaker happened to be a young lady that was in our second debutante ball and is now with the district attorney's office as a prosecuting attorney in Rock Island. That's the thanks, you know. Many members of the Mexican-American organization have enjoyed that same sense of accomplishment within their own families. These sons and daughters of immigrant parents who came to the United States for a chance at a better life have worked mostly blue-collar jobs so that their sons and daughters could go to college. We appreciated what our parents did for us. They felt that there was a better life somewhere else and to come to this country that was completely foreign to them the language, the climate, uh, how they were treated, we realized that life for us was, was much better. And had it not been for our parents, it wouldn't be that way. Cervantes grew up in the west end of Moline. His father worked a low-wage job with the railroad, and the family spent its first years living in an abandoned boxcar. His father died in 1934, leaving his mother to raise seven children through tough depression years. Right out of high school, Cervantes joined the army and served under General Patton, participating in the Normandy invasion. After returning from the war, he worked for the railroad and retired from the city of Davenport's building inspector's office. It was there he got wind of the sale of the call ballroom. I just went back to the membership and told them that in my judgment, the acquisition cost of this building was worth it. Where did you come from? All the way from. That was eight years and $500,000 ago. Time well spent to help preserve a landmark, money well spent to continue a tradition. Are you ready to play? But for the Mexican American organization, the importance of owning the call ballroom can't be measured in dollars. Its real value is calculated in the currency of community. I am never satisfied. I know that there are things that we would still like to do. Who knows how much life we have left, but we've reached the first goal. So from here on in, let's move to the next goal. The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.